When I made my Shinji Ikari character analysis three years back, there was a new understanding of the character I was trying to bring to the table. Rei Ayanami, on the other hand, she's the most popular character in the franchise in Japan and only second to Asuka here in the States. Having a fresh perspective on her is a huge undertaking, harder than I ever anticipated, thusly the two or so years I put off making this video. What more can be said about Rei? The Oedipal characteristics, the objectification, the achievement of personhood and how Evangelion defines that? Every angle seems tired and obvious in 2018, but why not give my take on these themes? If I do my job right, hopefully you'll learn something new. Around 2004, Gendo and Fuyutsuki attempted to bring Shinji's mother, Yui, back, using her remains from Eva Unit 1's core and Lilith. This attempt failed, but Rei was born as a consequence. Her body is maintained and monitored by Ritsuko Akagi, who is able to manipulate her age to match that of Shinji and the rest of the would-be pilots. She lives alone, unlike Shinji and Asuka, and spends her time reading books and staring aimlessly out the window. Rei grows closer to Shinji in particular, given Shinji encourages her to expand beyond her limited perspective. She eventually develops some shades of individuality, but dies before discovering true personhood. Given Gendo and Nerve were able to create multiple copies, she comes back anew with her memories wiped. Unbeknownst to them, however, she experiences a continuity of emotions and is able to complete her arc in End of Evangelion by rejecting Gendo's version of instrumentality, instead granting it to Shinji, the only one who showed her true compassion. It was her decision in the end. Rei acts as a counterpoint and in parallel to the Yamato Nadeshko, an ideal for Japanese women to ascribe to in the 19th century. Quiet and shy, but wild at heart, wise and good at domestic work, these are what characterizes the Yamato Nadeshko. Rei acts as a parody of these ideas. She's unhygienic, emotionally detached, but extremely submissive. She's more in line with the American China doll stereotype, an archetype that was ascribed to Asian women in old Hollywood. Submissive, docile, obedient, and disposable. This perfectly describes the first scene we see her in. Rei is clearly injured beyond reason, but is ordered to get in the Ava unit, and almost does so until Shinji takes the reins. These qualities are what Rei transcends over time. Acting as a kind of China doll herself, it makes sense why Rei is frequently compared to that of a doll, especially by Asuka. Rei and Asuka have a strange relationship, they're meant to be writing foils to one another, inverse but complementary. There's an impression of Rei's unit being simplified and understated, while Asuka's is exaggerated and over the top, even by the number of eyes. The color of the units are also contrasted with red and blue, similarly with their hair and eyes. According to the character designer Yoshiyuki Satomoto, this was all completely intentional. When they first meet, Rei is shown reading old Germanic texts, linking the two intrinsically. As a kind of non sequitur, I had my friend Honest Phil, who's German, translate the writing, and interestingly, one part pertains to <coughs> Louis I, Prince of Anhalt, Kurten, the founder of the fruit bearing society. He wanted to preserve the traditions of the Germanic language, and ironically, his name was even modernized in history books. The other half is a poem about a father who gives his son everything he needs to create happiness for himself, perhaps lending insight into Gendo's relationship to Shinji, giving him the Eva unit. It's an easter egg to be sure, considering we couldn't even read this until the Blu-ray release, but it's fascinating nonetheless. I've linked Phil's full translations below along with his channel. Returning to the topic at hand, the interaction between Rei and Asuka is the cleverest in the entire show. Episode 11, for example, when Asuka orders Rei to take up being the support unit instead of a human shield, Rei up until now has been the one to get beat down for the sake of supporting someone else, such as in episode 6. Asuka is pushing Rei out of that comfort zone, not out of compassion, but out of pride wanting to usurp her. In a way, however, it's good for Rei. She can now stop seeing herself as just a masochistic entity. It expands her limits as part of the team, and it comes back to play when Rei takes it upon herself, defying Gendo's wishes in order to assist Asuka in episode 19. It's wonderful writing, and of course their dynamic is most famous in episode 22's infamous elevator scene. What's most intriguing about this scene is that Rei chooses to engage Asuka first. Rei has never engaged Asuka in such a manner before, and it's always been the reverse, where Asuka engages Rei. But I think it's clear that Rei has developed concern for Asuka given her depressive state in episode 22. Rei lends her sound advice, saying that Asuka needs to humanize the Eva unit because they have souls. Kokoro. Kokoro Asuka then refers to both Rei and the Eva unit as a ningyo. 
神寺だけじゃなく機械人形みたいなあんたにまで同情されるとはこの私も焼きが回ったわね人形 can act as a catch all term for doll literally meaning human shape however 人形 typically have a historical Shinto implication 人形 are often traditional handcrafted dolls given to children as early as the 14th century they were thought to develop a soul from being part of a family with all the interactions at hand they'd start to become human in a way 私は人形じゃない人形 weren't just disposed of either and after a doll would become old Japanese families would hold funerals for them to prevent their spirits from haunting them it's obvious to me that this was an intentional parallel otherwise the katakana word doru might be just as appropriate for Miss Western German over here using the word ningyo to describe Rei tells me that like the ningyo Rei has developed a soul just as the Eva units have souls so too does Rei and I think by its use of the word Ano is defining personhood through experience. We develop into our own as people once we've had enough experiences with others. It begins to make sense why Rei, after dying, experiences continuity. Her soul was rejected from Guff. There's no funeral, no proper death. Rei's soul lives on, haunting the world, so to speak, and took over another Ningyo in order to keep living. The most haunting image in episode one is of Rei staring at Shinji from afar before disappearing into thin air. Just as she vanishes, doves are shown flying overhead. Not only does this call forward to the design of the MP Ava units, but doves are also symbolic of messengers in the post apocalyptic landscape, at least within the story of Noah and the flood. And considering that Kaoru's story acts as a kind of Jesus Judas parallel, I think this could be one of those rare cases where religious symbolism is intentional here. This ray is undoubtedly Quantum Ray from End of Evangelion, becoming an angelic deity after merging with Lilith. Ray is shown throughout the film being capable of manipulating time and space to appear in multiple places at once. It also explains why she was able to descend into terminal dogma without an Ava unit. It in episode 24. This was never really Rei, but Quantum Rei. She acts as a kind of messenger to Shinji and to the audience, warning us about what's to come, foreshadowing future events. There's more nods to the events of End of Evangelion in episode 21, where Fryutsuki gets a card from Gendo with an illustration of a blue haired angel holding a heart. The word heart in Japanese is kokoro, which means soul. It's interesting how this image is an exact parallel to Lilith Rei holding the souls of all of humanity. Rei is also often associated with the moon, which, to be sure, Is reflected in the lore with angels originating from the white moon. It could also be a reference to Lilith's black mask inscribed with lunar craters. The moon is symbolic of motherhood and the menstrual cycle in many cultures. Running in tandem to Rei's relationship with Shinji and Gendo. As aforementioned, Rei is often seen as an Oedipal entity by the community. And to quote series creator Hideaki Anno, there was this replacement by a robot, so the original mother is the robot, but then there is a mother of the same age, Rei Ayanami, by Shinji's side. She is also by the side of the real father. There is also another father there, Adam, who governs the overall course of events, an Oedipus complex within these multiple structures. That is what I wanted to do. The Oedipus complex refers to an ancient. Greek tragedy about a man who murdered his father to sleep with his mother, but he was unaware of who they were until it was too late. The story would be used by Freud in his book Interpretation of Dreams to describe the condition of a young male hating their father and desiring their mother. The mother is seen as protection and acceptance, while the father is conflict and violence. Evangelion is no stranger to psychoanalytic theory, even going so far as to name whole episodes after the developmental stages proposed by Freud. Gendo's relationship to Rei is rather questionable in this context. Ritsuko's position in episode 15 is replaced with Rei in 24. Ritsuko is shown as a substitute for Rei and vice versa in the final episodes of the series. Considering Ritsuko used to be a sexual partner for Gendo, the implications of this new dynamic are chilling. Gendo cares about Rei in regards to his use of her as a pawn in his plan to bring Yui, his wife, back from the Ava unit. He has conditioned her to accept herself as replaceable. The fact he would go so far as to even copy her for the dummy plug system demonstrates his willingness to commodify her and remove Remove her individuality. Rei is an emotional substitute for Gendo at most, acting as a surrogate for Yui. She doesn't recognize this initially, but begins to in episode 23 after actually having been replaced. Shinji, on the other hand, objectifies her the least out of the males in her life. Considering how much of a horny bugger Shinji is, that's pretty impressive.
okay, let me explain. In episode 5, Toji and Kensuke ogle the girls and confront Shinji about staring at Rei in particular. They talk about Rei's thighs and breasts, reducing her to body parts. Shinji, on the other hand, expresses genuine concern about her isolating herself from the group, and indeed the camera does not fetishize her as Shinji is staring. Later, Shinji is told to deliver a card to her, and though he is teased about it for staring at her picture, he again clarifies that it's out of concern and interest for her well-being. When he checks to see if she's okay in episode 6 after battling Ramiel, it subverts the scene where Gendo is shown doing the same in episode 5. Gendo asks if she's alright, and she nods, and he curtly responds with, so good. It comes across as cold in the long run. Kurt. Ray clearly sees this moment as compassionate, however. Holding onto Gendo's glasses as a memento of this occasion, it's only because of her limited understanding of compassion at this stage of her existence that she does so to begin with. The glasses are eventually destroyed by her in End of Evangelion for this reason. They were never genuine. Shinji, on the other hand, breaks down in tears, relieved she wasn't killed, and suggests for her to smile, to express herself. This is true compassion, and these two moments comparatively inform Ray's decision in End of Evangelion, why she picks Shinji over Gendo, I think Shinji sees Rei's individuality as valuable. That's not to say that he isn't also attracted to her sexually, but this Oedipal construct is one that Shinji and Rei metaphorically tear down through the reduction of instrumentality and its comforts. It's not something virtuous. Shinji and Rei separate, showing this to be the case. Shinji does not kill Gendo, as the Oedipus prophecy foretold in the Greek drama, and in fact, doesn't even confront him in the finale. This is perfect for both Shinji and Rei's arcs, and in the end, Gendo is surrounded by the same wall patterns of Rei's room, suggesting his fate is truly decided by her, and not the other way around, as had been initially intended. In episode 5, Shinji goes to Rei's apartment. It's in a complex represented by multiple buildings, all aligned and stretching far out into the distance. Mechanical sound effects are clanging in the background. The motifs are self-explanatory, demonstrating Rei's nature as a mechanical, commodified product, easily capable of being reproduced and duplicated. Her role in the series is to develop out of this identity. Keep this in mind, as I'm going to be talking about Rei Ayanami today, and what she means for the anime industry as a whole. Evangelion was able to be successful in the long run, Run thanks to its merchandising. In Tokyo, there is a store dedicated to nothing but Evangelion merch, selling anything from Evangelion themed glasses to Evangelion themed umbrellas. What started its success, intentionally or not, is a limited number of prints of Eva themed products, as requested by Hideakiano himself. This eventually led to the explosive demand for such items. Companies like Nintendo have latched onto this method with their products like the NES Classic and the Wii, increasing demand by putting very few out there on the market. In particular, a Rei Ayanami doll covered in bandages, quote, sold like wildfire, and became the face of Evangelion's marketing. In Aerial Magazine, Hideakiano expressed his surprise. It's strange that Evangelion has become such a hit. All the characters are so sick, in spite of the characters being in incredibly disturbed and mentally ill, there was a fetishization for them. For better or worse, Rei Ayanami and indeed much of the cast of Eva, including Kaoru and Shinji and Asuka, have spawned a whole movement within the anime industry creating shell replicas of the Eva cast without any subversion or depth that originally defined them. Rei herself is the most guilty of this, creating a whole lineup of characters referred to in pop culture as the Rei Ayanami XB and being a contributing factor in the rise of Moe culture, Moe being a whole subculture of fandom that worships and adores an ideal of cuteness, the desire for the audience to protect cute characters, particularly girls, from harm. Is it a surprise then that the version of Rei that sold the best was the one where she was in bandages? To quote Patrick Galbraith of Tokyo University, otaku scholar Okuda Toshio states that Moe is most strongly felt amongst the third generation of otaku, or Japanese born in the 1980s who watched Neon Genesis Evangelion in middle school and grew up amid the wealth of anime, manga, games, and character merchandise following the seminal anime series. As Okura sees it, there is a strong tendency amongst this generation of otaku to see otaku hobbies as a form of pure sanctity. Rei and the cast of Evangelion have accomplished the opposite of what the series communicates. Evangelion was meant to send out a message to escapist otaku of the 90s who'd shrink away from responsibility, and instead it was used as a form of escapism. In a 2012 interview just before the release of Evangelion 3.0, Hideaki Anno spoke about his feelings regarding Neon Genesis. As for Neon Genesis Evangelion, 
Evangelion. Many people took what I made as entertainment and turned it into a target of dependence. I wanted to take responsibility for those people becoming impudent. However, I've started to pull back from that subject of criticizing escapist otaku. Those kinds of people don't understand no matter what you say. I finally realized there is nothing you can do. Ano and the Eva crew owe their success to escapism, in spite of everything about Evangelion being fundamentally anti-escapist. The Studio Kara short Mi 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 pokes fun at this. Evangelion unintentionally has contributed to a stagnation of anime post-1990s and the Hikikomori Otaku Uprising. And if you ask me, in my deeply, deeply, deeply subjective opinion, anime's quality has dropped. When I compare my personal top shows of the 2010s to shows of the 90s and 2000s, there's no contest in terms of the amount of creativity and ambition. There's a clear upswing of moe and comedy post Haruhi Suzumiya to the point where even shows considered to be serious works in the 2010s are obsessed with presentations of cuteness, moe, and cliched archetypes. With few exceptions, ambition and creativity are at an all-time low, with the most interesting anime being adaptations of older IPs such as Ping Pong the Animation or JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. As we've seen with Berserk 2016, FLCL2, and Darling in the Franks, there can be an utter failure to reclaim the magic of older eras. Call me blinded by nostalgia and filtering the good from the mediocre, but I genuinely feel this era right now has felt the impact of moe and otaku culture harder than any, and for me, it's disappointing. It's not what I liked about anime. The times are changing for the worse, and for what it's worth, I think Hideaki Anno is making the best out of a depressing situation. We wouldn't have stuff like Dragon Dentist or Yuri on Ice without Studio Kara's Animator Expo, and we wouldn't have the Expo without the merchandising of Neon Genesis and the Rebuild. Evangelion has inspired and continues to inspire young filmmakers and animators, not even just from Japan. I wouldn't be going for my masters in film production without Eva. Rei herself, despite becoming everything she stood against, has provided opportunities for people, and for that, I am thankful for what she is. If you liked this video, consider supporting me on Patreon for early access to videos, discarded scripts, and lengthy notes for videos like this one. A big thank you to Honest Phil for doing those German translations. As I said before, the link is below. Uh, also, a shout out to my patrons, Angelica Rivera, Zweihander Fiend, Thanatos388, Jaren R, Lucia S, Angel Louis Ruiz, Harrison Fell. Thank you so much and Goat Jesus out.